Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fuck's Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and the Massachusetts New England cottontail in the seat next to me is Ellen. Here comes Ellen Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. Ellen, Ellen, no. Ellen, yes. Hippity hoppity. Ellen, no. Fine. Let's hippity hoppity into the Phoenix flashback. Ellen. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 29, Career Advice, and the film scenes that don't really correspond beyond a very similar line. Harry calculated the odds of his little fireplace plan succeeding versus the odds he was doing something incredibly stupid and went ahead anyway. Sirius and Lupin showed little to no remorse for the way they acted as kids. Filch gets way too excited about becoming a dominatrix, and Pepto Bitchmall gets swamped with mischief-making management when the twins make their grand exit from academia. During episode 171, Do the Thing, Harry! Our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on the portable swamp being left out of the movie? Hey guys, Jackson here with my Potter pondering for this week. Portable swamp... Now, this is one of those moments where I liked some of the things that the movie did, but I still hate that things were left out. I did like how they did Fred and George's exit from Hogwarts, although it still would have been better if they'd had the portable swamp, them summoning their brooms, telling Peeves to give her hell, and just riding out through the open doors. Don't get me wrong, the movie version was alright, especially with that big fireworks W following them. But it just could have been better if it was done with the book, including the portable swamp. Hi Ellen and Katie, this is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. How do I feel about them leaving out the portable swamp? Upset, because that was a fine piece of magic per Professor Flitwick. And a tribute to Fred and George. Like, come on now. Who wouldn't have wanted to see that lady struggle through the swamp? And I get it. More CGI costs for, you know, some information that doesn't move along the plot. But, damn, we need a TV show that's episode by chapter, bruh. Because that would have been really nice to see. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, which teams are playing in the final Quidditch match of the season? The two teams were Gryffindor and Ravenclaw. Congratulations goes to Kalista Whitewolf. Woohoo! Dave was the first to answer, but said Gryffindor and Slytherin. Hmm. So I give him an honorable mention for the speed. It's not usually something the guy wants a mention for, but sure. Good job, Dave. <laughs> Kalista and Mike answered at nearly the same time, but after clicking back and forth a couple of times to watch the times posted change, I saw Kalista's change from seven minutes to eight minutes first, making her the winner by seconds. Wow. I think Mike and Megan might have some new competition. Think she might start up a streak? I don't know. We shall see. Good to have some new blood in there, though. Right? For now, let's dive into the first half of chapter 30, Grop, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Chapter 30, Grop, Part 1. Fred and George's departure is retold so many times that it's becoming the stuff of legend, and within a week is exaggerated to be even more legendary. Other students talk about wanting to copy them, saying they might just do a Weasley. The twins also made sure no one would forget them quickly as they didn't leave any directions for how to get rid of the swamp, which fills the corridor on the fifth floor. As Filch and Umbridge can't figure out how to get rid of it, they just end up roping it off and Filch is stuck with the job of punting students across it to their classrooms. 
Harry is positive that McGonagall or Flitwick would be able to remove the swamp, but the teachers all seem to prefer to watch Umbridge struggle. Since there were two broom-shaped holes in Umbridge's office door, Filch has it refitted for a new door, and Harry's broom is moved to the dungeons, where it is rumored to be guarded by a security troll. But Umbridge's troubles are far from over, since there are a ton of students now vying for the role of troublemakers-in-chief, and someone managed to slip a Niffler into her office. It tore the place apart, looking for shiny objects, and attacked her as she re-entered, trying to bite the rings off her fingers. Dung bombs and stink pellets are regularly dropped in the corridors, to the point that performing the bubblehead charm between lessons is becoming the norm. Filch prowls the corridors with his horsewhip ready, but there are so many troublemakers, he doesn't really know which way to turn. The Inquisitorial Squad is attempting to help him, but odd things keep happening to them, like Warrington developing a skin condition and Pansy Parkinson sprouting antlers. In addition to this, it's becoming very clear just how many skiving snack boxes Fred and George sold before leaving, because Umbridge only has to enter her classroom to have the students there begin to faint, vomit, develop fevers, or spew blood from their noses. Umbridge is furious, but can't figure out the source of all the mysterious illnesses, and the students only stubbornly tell her that they're suffering from Umbridge-itis. When she still doesn't get any answers after putting four consecutive classes into detention, she has no choice but to let the six students leave her classroom in droves. This is also nothing compared to the chaos Peeves has been causing, which includes upending tables, bursting out of blackboards, toppling statues and vases, shutting Mrs. Norris inside suits of armor, smashing lanterns, snuffing out candles, juggling burning torches over students' heads, causing stacks of parchment to fall into fires or out windows, flooding the second floor by pulling all of the bathroom taps off, and dropping a bag of tarantulas in the Great Hall during breakfast. Then, when he needs a break from all that, he follows Umbridge around for hours and blows raspberries every time she speaks. No one on staff is helping her, except for Filch. Harry is even positive he saw McGonagall tell Peeves the correct direction to unscrew a crystal chandelier. Plus, Montague still has not recovered from the vanishing cabinet toilet incident, and his parents show up looking extremely angry. Hermione wonders if they should say something in case it helps Madame Pomfrey cure him, but Ron is indifferent and Harry is just happy it's causing more trouble for Umbridge. They're in charms class, trying to charm their teacups to have legs, and Harry and Ron are both struggling. They continue discussing the situation as Hermione charms her teacup perfectly, and Ron tells her that it's him she should be worried about. When she asks why, he explains that he's half expecting a howler from his mom about Fred and George leaving since he didn't stop them. Hermione points out that that wouldn't be fair, since they obviously had this plan for a while if they have premises. Ron wonders how they got the premises, since it would require a lot of gold, and Hermione expresses concern that Mundungus may have talked them into selling stolen goods. Harry cuts her off to reassure her that he hasn't, and confesses that he gave him his Triwizard Tournament winnings. Hermione admonishes him for this, but Harry just insists that he doesn't regret it since he doesn't need the gold and they will be great at a joke shop. Ron is relieved since this makes it Harry's fault and not his and asks if he can tell his mum. Harry agrees that he probably better, especially if she thinks they've been receiving stolen cauldrons or something. Hermione doesn't say anything else, but Harry doesn't expect that to last long. When she does open her mouth to speak again, after they head out of the castle for break, Harry interrupts her to tell her it's no good nagging him, he's already given the gold, and they've clearly already spent a lot of it. Hermione responds that she wasn't going to bring up Fred and George, but rather ask Harry when he's going to go back to Snape to resume Occlumency lessons. 
After the initial excitement of the twins' departure wore off, Ron and Hermione had asked him about Sirius, and he confided in them why he wanted to talk to him in the first place. Now he regrets that, since Hermione keeps bringing it up again when he least expects it. This time, she insists that he hasn't stopped having the funny dreams, since Ron told her he was muttering something about just a bit farther the previous night. Harry brutally says that he dreamt he was watching Ron play Quidditch and was trying to get him to stretch out a bit further to grab the quaffle. Ron blushes and Harry feels some vindictive pleasure for the lie. He had dreamt of the Department of Mysteries corridor again, making it all the way to the cavernous room with the shelves full of dusty glass spears, hurrying straight to row number 97, but again waking up before he reached his goal. Hermione asks him if he is trying to block his mind, and Harry insists that he is, but can't quite meet her eye, because he's too curious about what is hidden in that room to actually try to block the dreams out. Ron changes the subject, speculating that if Montague doesn't recover before Slytherin plays Hufflepuff, they might have a chance at winning the cup. Harry agrees it is possible, but loses track of the conversation when he sees Cho walk across the courtyard, determinately not looking at him. The final match of the season is to take place on the last weekend of May. Though Slytherin was narrowly beat by Hufflepuff in the previous match, Gryffindor is not daring to hope for victory, mainly because of Ron's abysmal goalkeeping record. Despite this, Ron seems to have found new optimism, figuring he can't get any worse. As they walk down to the pitch, Hermione says that she thinks Ron might do better without Fred and George around, since they never really gave him a lot of confidence. When they see Luna Lovegood walk past them wearing what appears to be a live eagle perched on top of her head, she remembers that Cho will be playing and says so to Harry, who has not forgotten. He merely grunts as they continue to the stands and find seats in the topmost row. The day is perfect and Harry finds himself hoping against hope that Ron doesn't give the Slytherins a reason to sing more choruses of Weasley is our king. Lee Jordan is again doing the commentary and starts off introducing the players as they enter the field. At the sound of Cho's name, Harry's stomach gives a little lurch, and he thinks about how he isn't sure what he wants anymore, aside from knowing that he can't stand any more rows. Even seeing her chat with Roger Davies only gives him a slight twinge of jealousy. As the game starts, Davies gets the quaffle and immediately scores, causing all the Gryffindors to groan and the Slytherins to begin singing. At this point, a hoarse voice whispers Harry and Hermione's names, and Harry looks around to see Hagrid. He has squeezed his way along the row behind them, ruffling the first and second year seated there, and looks extremely anxious as he hunches over in a futile attempt not to be seen. He whispers to them, asking if they will go with him while everyone is distracted watching the match. His eyes are both blackened, his nose is dripping with blood, and he looks so woeful that Harry agrees. He and Hermione edge down their row as Hagrid makes his way back down the row behind. When they reach the stairs, he expresses how much he appreciates it, but also looks around nervously and states that he hopes she doesn't notice them gone. Harry asks if he means Umbridge, and assures Hagrid that she won't, since she has the whole Inquisitorial squad sitting with her, and must be expecting some trouble at the match. Hagrid says that some trouble wouldn't hurt, since it would give them more time, and Hermione looks concerned as she asks him what it is. He merely insists that she will see in a moment, and looks back as a great roar comes from the stands wondering if someone just scored. Harry sighs and says it'll be Ravenclaw, and Hagrid distractedly says that's good, as he continues to head across the lawn towards his cabin. Harry and Hermione have to jog to keep up with him, and when they reach the cabin, they both automatically turn towards it, but Hagrid keeps moving past it and into the shade of the trees, where he grabs a crossbow that's leaning against one. He turns back to Harry and Hermione when he realizes they aren't with him anymore and tells them that they are going into the forest. 
Harry questions this, and Hagrid tells him yeah, and to hurry so they aren't seen. He strides into the forest, and Harry and Hermione exchange a look before running to catch up to him. Harry asks Hagrid why he's armed, and Hagrid tells him that it's a precaution since they are going further in than they did the day he showed them the Thestrals, and because Ferenz is no longer living in the forest. Hermione asks why Ferenz leaving made a difference, and he explains that the other centaurs are angry with Hagrid for stepping in when they nearly kicked Ferenz to death for agreeing to work for Dumbledore. Hermione is shocked that they attacked him, and Harry is impressed that he stopped the attack by himself. Hagrid mentions that he couldn't leave them to kill him, and that it was lucky he was passing, also saying that he would have thought Ferenz would have remembered that before sending stupid warnings. Harry and Hermione exchange glances again, but Hagrid doesn't elaborate and instead says that the centaurs are clever and have a lot of influence in the forest, so he has to be more cautious. Hermione asks if they are there because of the centaurs, and Hagrid says no, though they could complicate the problem, and explains that they will see what he means in a bit. This chapter does have corresponding film scenes. They just don't fit into this half of the chapter. So once again, we'll be talking about everything that was left out. Which is predominantly Quidditch in this case. I mean, yeah, I miss having Quidditch in the movie, sure, just because of content, but uh, sports ball. I mean, now it's basically been two full movies that we haven't had any. Pretty much. So, yeah, deprived. Sure. (laughs) For the sports ball folks. (laughs) (laughs) Technically, the way that this section of the chapter ends kind of corresponds with the movie scene, Mm -hmm. but it's so different And it's kind of a weird divide for the chapter that I just sort of said, we'll take it to this point and pick up where they more directly line up. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah. But the chapter starts off in the glory and legend of Fred and George's departure. Which I was pretty goddamn legendary. It was legend. Wait for it. Dairy. Dairy. (laughs) It's now becoming a thing where people talk about wanting to do a Weasley. <laughs> Which, I mean, I've said that for years. but I think you mean that in a different was, way. <laughs> I just spit it, too. <laughs> That's how excited That's... she is, folks. <laughs> Whew. Whew, those Weasleys. Sorry. <laughs> and like anyone was going to forget them to begin with, they cemented being memorable With the mere fact that they did not leave the directions for how to get rid of said swamp. Well, why would they? That seems silly. I'm sure that if you purchase one of their swamps, it comes with directions. Yeah, but you gotta buy it first, which is pretty genius. But they conveniently forgot to leave the directions Mm -hmm. behind. Oh, yeah. And hilariously, Filch and Pepto Bitchmall cannot figure out how to get rid of it. I feel like that might have been by design. You think? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Definitely. This is one of those things that I spent 15 years of my life, maybe more, (laughs) picturing this entirely wrong. And you know what? I'm okay with it. Yeah. Because my vision of it is so much funnier. (laughs) But because they can't get rid of the swamp... It's filling the entire fifth floor corridor. Oh, yeah. So they just rope it off, and Filch is given the job of punting students across it. Now, if you live in America like we do... (laughs) Punting has a very different meaning. You probably pictured him... Fucking drop kicking, yeah. (laughs) Just... I literally thought Filch was lining up on one end of the swamp and (laughs) kicking kids over the swamp. (laughs) Which I wouldn't put past him. Right. It didn't seem out of character. I never once questioned that visual and I thought it was hilarious. And I never once questioned anybody else being like, isn't there a better way? (laughs) No. No, it was just like. That's just what he did. This tracks. And then recently, I think it was within starting this podcast, we came across a meme that explained that a punch is a boat. It is. (laughs) It is. He was a punting cunt. Yeah. But yeah, so I actually really want to know if anybody else had this vision. Obviously, if you have regularly used the word punt 
as a boat and you know what that meant you probably didn't do this but those of you that listen to us here in the united states (laughs) did anybody think this too or any other countries where they don't use it as well yeah let us know is this us just being ignorant americans (laughs) (laughs) well i think there's a at least a little bit of that, but... That's why I said just us. Yeah. <laughs> or are we somewhat justified in this confusion? Yeah. I don't know. It cracks me up now. Oh, for sure. My old lady's going to show here, because it reminds me of the movie Mall Rats, where the guy's trying to look at the magic eye picture. Mm-hmm. And people keep telling him it's a sailboat. And it's a sailboat, it's a sailboat. And this little kid comes up and he goes, wow, it's a schooner. <laughs> and the guy goes, you dumb bastard. It's not a schooner, it's a sailboat. And the kid goes, schooner is a sailboat, stupid head. I mean, that is exactly how I felt when I saw that meme that right? explained it to me, so. <laughs> exactly. I'm curious if anybody else is willing to admit their own idiocy <laughs> and ignorance <laughs> like us, because we just did this for... I'd say, you know, several hundred people. Oh, yeah. At least. At at the very least, sure. Yeah. We only know how many downloads we get. We don't actually know who just streams us. Yeah. Estimation. We hope there's a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Not that we mind talking to just each other, either. Right. We're going to do it anyway. Right. It's (laughs) happening. I can't get rid of Ellen if I try, so. Oh, no. She's stuck. Yep. Tied to the chair, just like episode one. (laughs) But moving on. Yes. So Harry is positive that somebody like McGonagall or Flitwick could easily get rid of this swamp. Oh, for sure. But all of the teachers are more in the camp of just letting Pepto Bitch Mall have a hard time. Just like with the fireworks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, sure. McGonagall or Flitwick could definitely have gotten rid of the swamp. But why? This is so much funnier. This is so much funnier. (laughs) Like... They're in the teacher's lounge just going, oh my God, did you see Filch just fucking drop kick that kid across the swamp? <laughs> like, that was pretty fucking hilarious, right? That's what I think happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I've been wanting to drop kick Nigel for years. Shit. Not in the book because. It was a joke. Maybe Michael, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fuck Michael. <laughs> <sighs> oh, poor kids. Poor kids, indeed. <laughs> So Pepto Bitch Mall also has to get a new door because when the twins did their Akio brooms, they just crashed straight through the door and left two broom shaped holes behind. Some broom holes? Broom holes. <laughs> that gives a completely different picture. It does. Yeah. Boy, they were really a couple of broom holes, weren't they? Yup. <laughs> anyway, for extra security. Like I said, new door. They'll chest to fit it. Sure. And they moved Harry's broom down to the dungeons where it is supposedly being guarded by a security troll. That just feels like a misuse of funding. I feel like she's the type to have a security troll slave or something. Just, just like in she's general, not paying yeah. that thing. <laughs> she just carries a security troll around with, well, not carries, but like she just brings a security troll wherever she goes. Yeah. Keeps all of her valuables with it. Sure. Why not? It's kind of funny that she's worried about Harry getting his broom back Mm -hmm. when he literally was in her office and could have just taken it if he wanted to. Yeah, big old facts. But then she would have known. She definitely would have known. And what can he do with it at this point? Yeah. I mean, what difference does it make, really? It's not like he can go play Quidditch on it. Yeah. It's not like he's going to just fuck off and leave like the twins. Right. Even though I'm sure he really wants to do a Weasley. Oh, fuck it, yeah. Well, not yet. We got to get to, like, book six. Namely the youngest. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Anywho. Foreshadowing. You'd think that getting a new door and having a security troll would solve some problems. You would think that, wouldn't you? But no. Not well. Pepto Bitch Mall has a whole long list of issues. Because... That's how everybody at Hogwarts wants it to be. (laughs) As we said in the flashback, she was quite swamped with problems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One big reason for this is now there are, I'm going to assume at least 75% of the students. Mm -hmm. Especially like in the glow of the rebel. Like there's a lot of kids who maybe normally wouldn't want to be a troublemaker. That's just like, oh, I got this. Oh yeah. The pushback is heavy. Yes. So tons of students are now, I'm not even going to say in fierce competition for the troublemaker in chief role. I think they're all working together. 
Yeah. I think this is a team effort. Yeah. And it's glorious. It's a little bit like when Matilda finally, like, gets her powers going and, like, attacks Trunchbull and shit. And then all the kids are just like, fuck this. Yeah. Yeah. Hells yeah. Yep. I agree. Mm Mm-hmm. The inspiration is absolutely there. Yeah. And everyone wants to get in on it. One of my... I can't even say favorite things. I almost said one of my favorite things. But there's so many amazing things that happen to Pepto Bitch Mall. It's really difficult to narrow it down to one. I mean, you can have more than one favorite, Ellen. I like them all. <laughs> well. But this is a good one. Somebody <laughs> managed to get a Niffler into her office. I love that. And it just tears the place apart. Just anything shiny. Grab, grab, grab. And of course, now since we've had Fantastic Beasts and have had the phenomenal Niffler scenes. Yes. We've seen what Nifflers can do now. Yeah. Yeah. So that changes this entirely. Like before we were just like, oh man, they let a Niffler in. That's pretty badass. Now it's destructive and adorable. Yeah. Now we're just like, oh shit, that Niffler went to town. And we really should have gotten to experience this so much sooner than we did. Should have. But I am very grateful for Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. And the mere fact that I can now picture this Niffler fucking up pepto bitch mall's just, office yep, just in around. all of its glory mm-hmm. i especially love the fact that when she comes back into the office it attacks her and just tries to bite her ugly rings off all of her fingers <laughs> it's just so great dung bombs and stink pellets are just constantly dropped in the corridors sure to the point that everyone basically Gets ready to leave class by performing the bubblehead charm on themselves so they can have clean oxygen while they walk. Yeah. How much do you want to bet that, like, Fred and George probably left for each house, left, like, a stash of, like, their wizard wheezes stuff hidden in each, like, common room or something like that? Maybe. And that way, like, be like, hey... You don't know why you need this now. But you're going to need this. But you're going to need this. I just imagine it being in one of the purple and orange boxes with like a little card. (laughs) In case of emergency. Yeah. It's the Justin case. Yeah. (laughs) Not the Justin Finch Fletchley case? No. Okay. That's too many syllables. Although I do kind of think that maybe he would have thought the Hufflepuff one did belong to him. That sounds about right. Yeah. (laughs) And I do like this. This is a new headcanon. I do think they left stuff behind mm-hmm. just to make sure. A little sample pack, maybe. Yeah, but I also think that they're fucking awesome and sold a whole bunch, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. And now it's becoming very clear how much they actually did sell and that these kids were smart enough to save them for the right moment. Mm-hmm. Because Pepto Bitch Mall only has to walk into her classroom. I bet they don't even give her... A second to start talking. She walks in the room and students start to faint, to vomit, to develop very dangerous fevers and to have just blood spew from their nose. Uh, Just tons of them. Tons of them showing all of these disgusting illnesses. Mm -hmm. And she has no idea why this is happening, which is a little bit different from the movie since... Yeah, she's pretty aware. The movie made it more apparent that they were directly affected by this like filch getting the pussy ones well that and there was an actual decree yeah she actually banned them number like 78 million or something like that i'm sure yeah but in the book she's not aware of why this is all happening which sorry can i just say that's pretty impressive for an entire school of students to be able to hide something like that. Yeah, but when the person that you're hiding it from's head so far up her own ass, or the minister's ass in this case, that you can't really see what's going on around you. That's valid. Yeah. I don't know if it's really that impressive or if she just sucks that much. She had probably had some, like, corny fudge in her eye or something. That is entirely possible, slash Mm -hmm. likely, slash... Disgusting. I'm going to go with yes. (laughs) (laughs) On all of the above. Yes. So naturally, she's pretty pissed. Understandable. Serves her right. Oh, boo-hoo. Right? And yet another favorite part is the fact that when she tries to ask them why this is happening, they all just tell her that they're suffering from umbrage-itis. <laughs> or, as we would like to say, pepto bitch itis Mm-hmm. It gives you nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, and diarrhea. <laughs> And apparently fevers and bloody noses and fainting spells. 
umbragitis pepto bitch malitis it's bad yeah that is not something to fuck around with she tries putting four classes entire classes in detention i mean at a certain point it's just no longer a punishment anymore right it's just be here at this time yeah to hang out with your friends right (laughs) because she clearly has no control over them i was gonna say she can't control what they're doing so you know they're just dicking around the whole time anyway could you imagine because now that i think about it the way that they did it in the movie where they had the entire da sitting there carving into the fucking back of their hands Mm -hmm. with that many kids like full classes i'd just sit there and go no i'm not doing this what's she gonna gonna do? do She ain't gonna do shit. She's out the fuck numbered. Yeah. And once they figured that out, she was fucked. Yup. And it was glorious. Mm Mm-hmm. Saying it was a Matilda. In the end, obviously, the detentions don't work. Sure. She has no choice but to let the majority of her classes leave to go to the hospital wing. Mm Mm-hmm. Because... What's she she gonna do? She can't keep them in her class sick like that. That's gross. That's not sanitary. Yeah. Nobody wants a kid, like, throwing up constantly no. in class. No. Because then the kids that aren't even sick are going to get sick. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I can guarantee this shit out of you. I do not need a puking pastel. I will puke the second someone else does. Yep. That's all there is to it. I have seen that happen in action as a teacher, so... Yeah. Let's just get back on topic. Yeah. Because now we're at some of my favorite things ever. That the movie couldn't give us in any way, shape, or form since they left out Peeves. Of course. And I don't understand. Like, how do you read this and not think, fuck you all. I don't care that we didn't put Peeves in the other movies. He needs to be in this goddamn movie. Right. We're bringing him in now. Yeah. He is off the bench for this shit. Right. Sure. I don't understand it. Like, how do you justify leaving this out? Because Peeves has taken... Fred and George's final request to heart. Mm-hmm. Is following to the letter. Oh, he commits. <laughs> yes. And he's just constantly, well, maybe not constantly because he does take breaks, but we'll get to that. But he is upending tables. He is bursting out of blackboards to scare the shit out of people during class. He's knocking over statues and faces. He shut Mrs. Norris inside a suit of armor twice. Love it. And she has to be rescued by Filch who finds her because she's yowling. And I do feel a little bit bad for the cat in this moment, but I don't feel bad for Filch or Pepto Bitch Mall. Mrs. Norris is a bitch, though. She's a she's cat, still but a she's cat. a bitch. <sighs> Animals she... don't deserve to be tortured just because their owners suck. Okay, but she's not being tortured because her owners suck. She's being tortured because she sucks. But she sucks because her owner sucks. I have no sympathy. I have sympathy for the kitten. You're like you're one of those people that like gets more upset if an animal's killed in a movie than a person, aren't you? Depends on the person. That's valid. <laughs> I'll even give you that. Sure. <laughs> Also depends on the animal. But he is smashing lanterns, blowing out candles, juggling burning torches over screaming students' heads, which is really fun because they actually have Peeves in Hogwarts Legacy. Mm-hmm. He pops up in random places doing Peevesy things. <laughs> and one of them is juggling flaming torches. Ah. So that was a fun little throw into the book there. Yeah. There's a bunch of things like that, throwing it into the book and the movie, like taking little things from it to tie Mm -hmm. it back in. It's really cute. Yeah. He's also causing neatly stacked, and I imagine this to just be like super tall, like kids homework and shit like that. (laughs) Yeah. Just stacks of parchment to mysteriously topple into fires or just out windows. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) God, I would be so upset though. I'm not even going to lie. Oh. Like on one hand, you're kind of like, okay, I get it. You're t- trying to fuck shit up and take no prisoners. But at the same time, dude, do you know how long that essay took me to write? I like to think that it's only Pepto Bitch Mall's papers. Yeah. Or maybe it's only like the Inquisitorial Squad's yeah, homework. Something. I'll do that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. He also manages to flood the second floor because he pulls all of the taps off of the bathroom. <laughs> faucets and then the biggest nope of all of the nopes sure is when he dumps a bag of tarantulas in the great hall during breakfast oh nope 
but I can imagine that would cause some chaos. Yeah. And then, like I said, he does occasionally take breaks. And this is one of my favorites. <laughs> Another one of your favorites? Yeah. Sure. His break involves following Pepto Bitch Mall around for hours and just blowing raspberries every single time she starts to speak. Yeah. <laughs> It's the best. It's the best. Yeah. It's the best. How do you not include this? It would be really annoying, especially for hours. <laughs> but it would be amazing to watch. Oh, it really would. It absolutely would. And then, like I said before, nobody is helping her. No. Except for Filch. But Filch is kind of useless. Like, he can fit a new door. He can restore a painting. But he has no magic. But he has no magic. Yeah. He's out of his depth. And then another one of my favorite parts. <laughs> you have more than one? Oh, my God. What? Harry actually witnesses McGonagall walk past Peeves, who's trying to unscrew a crystal chandelier. Okay. And instead of trying to stop him, McGonagall mm-hmm. just says, it unscrews the other way. <laughs> I love that. It's... I love McGonagall. I know. I love her. <sighs> It's so perfect. Mm -hmm. She's got another line towards the end that is one of my all-time favorites as well. Mm -hmm. And Flitwick has another moment, too, that makes me really happy. But it's not in this (laughs) section, so we're going to move on. (laughs) We're going to keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. And as if that is not enough chaos. Mm -hmm. On top of this, she's got angry parents showing up at the school because Montague has still not recovered. And I bet you anything... That the fact that, A, they don't know what happened to him, why it happened to him, or how to help him recover, that they didn't give the parents much information and now they're showing up pissed. Oh, no, dude. And having had to deal with upset parents before, Mm -hmm. that is a nightmare. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming, too, they've been frisking the owls since long before we knew that they were frisking the owls. True. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm sure they went through all the letters home, like, okay, who's saying shit about us? Right. Like, and fixing, you know, they're probably still sending them, but they're like taking out. <laughs> Redacted. Redacted. Yeah, exactly. Parents are getting mostly blacked out letters. <laughs> exactly. This letter was not ministry approved. Yeah. The problem is you can't redact an entire child being Montague. So... That happens, and the parents are just like, the fuck? One parent hears about it, then another parent hears about it. It's a whole parent phone tree, or I guess flu tree, you'd call it, kind of bullshit. And then everyone's like, wait a minute, what the fuck has been going on this entire goddamn year? Because this is ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous, and I'm not trying to say that the parents don't have a right to be mad, just that it is a nightmare to deal with mad parents. So sucks to be Pepto Bitch Mom. Sucks to suck. I would like to also think that you're not straight up like carving into the back of the kids' hands. No. So Definitely I don't think not. you would have to worry about it as much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, usually when I have to deal with angry parents, it's not always justified. Or it could be because of another kid did something to their kid. And it's still frustrating to deal with. In this particular instance, though, it's just extra fun things for Pepto Bitch Mall to deal with. And doesn't make it any less of a nightmare, but it's just a deserved nightmare. It's a schadenfreude type of deal. Yes. Really. We love to see it happen to such a nice lady. Mm Mm-hmm. Not so much Hermione, because she actually, well, I don't think it has anything to do with Pepto Bitch Mall. It's more that she's just a compassionate person and is a little bit worried about Montague and thinks maybe they should say something so that Madame Pomfrey can cure him in case it helps. And Ron just thinks, why would we do that? He's fine. He's going to be fine. And Harry says that he's just happy it's causing more trouble for Pepto Bitch Mall. Like, no, we don't have to say anything. Fuck her. Fuck him. (laughs) They'll be fine. Who gives a shit? Right? And they're having this whole conversation about it while they're in charms class. And their whole big task is to give teacups legs. 
like you do. Right. Yeah. I think this would have just been so cute to see. We didn't get to see enough of the actual <laughs> magical lessons. Mm -hmm. Of course, Harry and Ron are not doing very well with this. Harry manages to get his to sprout legs, but they're so short they don't even reach the table. So it's just these legs like do 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 off the side of the cup. Just little turtle legs. Yeah. Just... <laughs> and then Ron actually makes long enough legs, but they're so skinny it can't actually support the cup, so it stands up and then like falls. <laughs> and then of course you have Hermione who does it perfectly. Of course she does. And it just, you know, stands up and starts scampering. She has to catch it before it jumps off the side of the table. Yeah. I just think it would have been so cute to see. Mm-hmm. It's no. one of those moments where, like, the movie left out some of the most magical parts of something that's supposed to be in a fucking magical world. And I genuinely think that's one of the reasons why Prisoner of Azkaban is my favorite. Because it just felt the most magical. Mm-hmm. It had the most, like... Just off to the side magic. Yeah. You really kind of felt like you were in a magical world because shit was just happening around them. I think the feel of that one was the yeah. most magical. Mm -hmm. I felt like we were in the stories the most then. Not that the yeah. first two didn't have a lot of the magic as well. No, but it was more focused on the magic, which is fine as well. But the magic in one and two was like in your face. Yeah. Whereas in three, it was the dude stirring his tea without... Mm -hmm. It felt more submerged. The entire yeah. environment and just feeling you got from it overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were more immersed, definitely. But anyway, we didn't get that in this one. No little fun little no. cute magic things. Just, you know, montages. What is this, a magic school where magic <laughs> shit happens? No. No. What? I mean, yes, but no. <laughs> Not in the movie. But so they keep working on their little cup things and having this conversation about whether or not they should help Montague. And Ron's just like, I don't even know why you're worried about him. It's me you should be worried about. And Hermione doesn't know why she should be worrying about Ron. And he says, because my mom's going to murder me. When the next letter that she wrote me gets through Pepto Bitchmall's owl frisking, <laughs> he half expects it to be a howler. Which, I mean, theoretically, wouldn't that go off then if... The owl gets frisked. Yeah, probably, but that'd be fun, too. Yeah, true. If I were a parent on, oh yeah, you know, the good side, I would send all of the howlers in the world just so that oh, they would sure. explode on Pepto Bitch Mall. Especially just address them directly to the kid and not to Pepto Bitch Mall. That way, when she frisks the owls, she gets a face full of howler. Yeah, it'd be great. But as we know, Ron is not in Ravenclaw, and he's just positive... He's going to be in trouble for Fred and George leaving. Like, it's going to be mm. his fault because he didn't stop them. Because he was going to be able to do that. Yeah, because that was ever an option. Which is basically what Hermione says. Really what she says is that it wouldn't be fair for him to be blamed. Because this is clearly something that they had planned for a while. Especially considering that they have premises. That's not something they can just get on a whim. Yeah, this wasn't spur of the moment. No, not in the least. But that makes Ron bring up how they got the premises because mm -hmm. that's kind of shady at this point he doesn't know other than that they would need a lot of gold for that and where would they have gotten a lot of gold and Hermione points out that she was wondering about that too because where would they get it are they doing things with stolen goods for dung rags mm -hmm. that would be problematic that would just be more fuel for the howler basically I mean, it just fell off the back of a broom. It's fine. Don't worry about right, it. Right. Totally cool. Yeah. Don't be a narc. <laughs> <laughs> Harry to the rescue mm -hmm. cuts off this line of thinking just to point out that that is definitely not the case. And they're like, how do you know? And he's like, because uh, I gave him the money. Boom. I gave him my quad wizard cup money. Mm -hmm. And Hermione says, oh, Harry, you did it. He goes, yeah, I did. And I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. Harry, no. Harry, fuck yeah. Harry did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says, I don't need the gold. Yeah. And they're going to be great at a joke shop. So where did I go wrong here? Right. Short answer, I didn't. No. And Ron is super happy to hear this because now it's not his fault. It's Harry's fault. Right. And Molly's never going to hate on Harry. No, never. No. He's the golden boy. Totally. And Ron just says, can I tell mom? 
<laughs> she can't blame me now. It's totally your fault. And Harry actually says, yeah, you're probably better, especially if she's going to end up thinking that they were receiving stolen cauldrons or something. Yeah, really. And obviously none of that could happen in the movie since this was not even a thing in Goblet of Fire. They got their giant Lucite cup and absolutely no cash whatsoever. Nope. Yeah. None of the galleons Mm -mm. for Harry to pass along to the twins. Nope. Not a goddamn nut. Nope. And apparently they were just really successful selling the Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes this year to have the premises. Yeah. Although we haven't gotten to that point in the movie yet since they switched things around so much. So we'll get to that. Yeah, exactly. But surprisingly, Hermione has nothing else to say and just goes quiet. Hmm. Harry figures this isn't going to last long because it's Hermione and she never stays quiet. She always has something to say, especially when it's a Harry no type situation. Oh, yeah. And they're making their way out of the castle on their break time. And she starts to open her mouth again. And Harry's just like, yep, here it goes. <laughs> but cuts her off before she can say anything at all. Just to say, you know, nagging me's not going to do any good. It's already done. I gave them the money. They've clearly spent a bunch of it. Just stop. And she says... I wasn't going to bring up Fred and George. And I think Harry is really doubting this. And if I'm being honest, I think she was going to bring up Fred and George and had to think of something else to say in this moment. Yeah. (laughs) And kind of went with the mic drop moment of, I was going to ask when you were going to go back to Snape to resume your occlumency lessons. Awkward. Yeah. Very awkward. I think that... Harry would have rather she brought up Fred and George. Right? (laughs) That's when she says that, and he's like, so about Fred and George. Right? So I also, I I gave them money, and I, I, you know what? I gave them extra money. I gave them all my money. My vault is empty. I gave them everything I have. That's, yeah. I did all the things for Fred and George. Just Fred and George. And you know what? I sent them with a couple of house elves to test their stuff out on. You know, like, like really (laughs) piss her off. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Except Harry's not Ravenclaw and not nearly that clever. No. All he can think about is the fact that he's really regretting filling them in on his conversation with Sirius and why he wanted to talk to him in the first place. Which he did so after all of the excitement of Fred and George's departure wore off. Yeah. Because they discussed that in length for quite a while, too. And then once it was just like, okay, this is becoming old news. So why'd you want to talk to Sirius? How'd that go? And Harry's over there like, well, (laughs) I saw this in the pensive and my dad's kind of a dick and I really want to know what Sirius had to say about that. And Snape kicked me out of Occlumency lessons and Lupin and Sirius think I should go back. And Hermione's like, yes, Harry, you should go back. Harry, yes. This is one of those times that I am going to Harry, yes, you. And Harry's over there going, Harry, no. Harry, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's like role reversal right now. Harry don't want to. No, Harry can't. Snape's going to murder me. Mm-hmm. Or worse, teach me. Or expel him. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, this isn't the first time that Hermione's brought it up. She kind of, like, drops it on him when he least expects it, which this is one of those times because he thought she was going to mention Fred and George, and she's like, Occlumency lessons. <laughs> And this time she's particularly saying, you haven't stopped having the dreams. I know Ron told me that you were muttering something about just a bit further last night. And it's like I said, Ron will talk to Hermione when it comes to things that are concerning about Harry. He keeps her in the loop. Yeah. But Harry has this amazing moment where he just decides to be a bit of a dick to his friend, especially for kind of telling on him. Mm hmm. And just says, it wasn't one of those dreams. I was dreaming Ron was playing Quidditch and I was telling him just a bit further to stretch out and get the quaffle. Were you though? Oh no, he definitely wasn't. But the way that Ron blushed after he said this made him feel just a little bit good in a vindictive sort of way. (laughs) Because he knows. He knows he was totally dreaming about the Department of Mysteries corridor. He knows that he made it all the way into the big room with all the dusty orbs. He made it to row 97 and almost got to where whatever is hidden there was hidden. And he woke up. Fucked it all up. And Hermione wants to know if he's actually trying to close his mind. And he's like, yeah, of course I am. Even though in his mind he's going, nope, I want to know what's in there. (laughs) Yeah. He's not. He's not trying at all. Harry's a cat. 
Yeah. He's like, I do what I want, and I want to know this. Ron being the one who probably finds himself in between these arguments between Hermione, Harry knowing, and Harry, Harry yesing, Mm -hmm. changes the subject. He's probably well adept at this. Yeah. And he just says that, you know, if Montague doesn't recover before Slytherin plays against Hufflepuff, we might actually have a chance of winning the cup. Because if Slytherin loses to Hufflepuff, there is the chance that they could pull out a win and win overall. And Harry's just like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, let's talk about this instead of Occlumency. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It is possible. You're absolutely right. And then he sees Cho walk across the courtyard. And kind of just completely loses track of what he's even agreeing to with Ron because he's just noticing her try to not notice him. Yeah. It's just super awkward. Well, for sure. The chapter then kind of jumps forward to that final match of the season. So they jump over the Hufflepuff Slytherin match, which Slytherin did, in fact, end up losing because Montague was not okay for Mm -hmm. playing. But despite that, Gryffindor, like all of the Gryffindors, don't really want to get their hopes up. Yeah. Mostly because Ron kind of sucks. A little bit. Not to mention they still have two shitty beaters. Yeah. Somehow, with all of this, Ron is actually the really optimistic one. Which is a big change. It is. And his motto kind of right now is, well, I can't get any worse, can I? (laughs) Oh, Ron. (laughs) So Harry and Hermione are making their way to the Quidditch pitch for this match. And Hermione is actually kind of thinking that Ron might do better since Fred and George aren't there. Because, you know, they were big brothering him a lot. And it didn't really give him a lot of confidence. Sure. They get a little bit distracted from this conversation because Luna Lovegood walks past them wearing what looks like a live eagle on her head. I mean, it's Luna. So, yeah, right. of course. Data totally tracks there. Yeah. I mean, we got to see the lion hat. Uh, not in this one. No, not in this one. But in general, we got to see yeah. the lion hat. Where the yeah. fuck was the eagle head? Yeah, no fucking eagles. There should have been. Also, don't forget, in the movie, the mascot was a raven. Yeah, well. Because creativity is just lost on them, apparently. Well, they're Ravenclaws. Their mascot should be a raven. Mm-hmm. There's that meme where it's Harry confronting Pepto Bitchmall. And he's saying, why is the Ravenclaw mascot an eagle? And Umbridge is just like, well, what would you want it to be? And he's like, um, I don't know, a raven? And it just makes me so angry. Yeah. <laughs> like, because eagles represent wisdom and that's what Ravenclaw is all about. Like, hello, this is yeah. not that difficult. The Gryffindor mascot is a lion, not a griffin. Right. And granted, they're similar, but so is a raven and an eagle. So, because they're both And birds. Hufflepuff is a badger, not a huffle or a puffin or whatever you wanted to <laughs> try and tie that into. Riddled Slytherin puffins. Slytherin makes total sense as a snake. Well. Slytherin. Hmm. But anyway, the sight of Luna reminds Hermione that it's Ravenclaw playing, which means Cho is going to be playing. And she, of course, brings this up to Harry because her tact is apparently just out the window at this point. Oh, my gosh, I completely forgot Cho's going to be playing. And Harry's just sitting there like, I didn't forget. (laughs) Really, all he does is just kind of grunt. And then they walk the rest of the way to the pitch and they go all the way up to the topmost row to get the best seats. And it's just this perfect day for Quidditch. To the point that Harry is actually starting to feel a little hopeful. Like yeah. maybe there is a chance Ron's not going to completely suck and we don't have to hear a bunch of renditions of Weasley as our king by the Slytherins. I mean, hope springs eternal, Harry. Yeah. Lee Jordan is doing the commentary as per usual, except it's not quite as animated as it used to be. He's been a little bit downhearted since the twins left. I think a lot of things probably went into that. The twins leaving, Pepto Bitch Mall existing, kind of everything probably puts a damper yeah. on any fun for him right now. Oh, this year in general mm-hmm. is fun dampered. It's been a tough time for Lee Jordan. Yeah. For everyone. Well, yes, but I'm fun dampered. In terms of, you know, Quidditch commentary. Yeah. 
you know, he could get away with his bullshit when it was McGonagall because, like, let's face it, McGonagall would call him on his shit, but she secretly liked it. Oh, she did. You like, know, you know that she, she talked about that with the other teachers in the staff room. Right? Like, she knew when she had to reprimand him, but really she was just kind of like, but you know I have show. to tell you this, right? Mm-hmm. But Pepto Bitch Mall doesn't have that sense of humor. She's just, no. Not even that sense of humor. I don't think she has a sense of humor. Well, there's probably that too, yeah. But anyway, he starts off the match introducing the teams as they come out onto the pitch before they kick off. And when he says Chang, Harry feels a little lurch in his stomach. Not the somersault that it used to do at the sight of her, the sound of her name. Just a little lurch. And he realizes that he's not even sure what he wants anymore other than no more fighting. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm so done with these stupid fights and all of the tears and even watching her chat with Roger Davies, who had asked her out previously. Yeah. Even watching them chat, he doesn't even barely feel jealous. Yeah, he's just kind of, you know what? Have at Not her, Not worth dude. it. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking have at her. Bring some tissues, man. You're going to need them. <laughs> like- yeah. So the game gets started. And, of course, Davies immediately gets the Quaffle and scores. So, of course, the Slytherins immediately start singing, Weasley was born in a bin. Of course they do. Yes. And I'm not entirely sure if this is a blessing or a curse. We'll get more into it next week. But they don't have to watch the rest of the match because they get interrupted by Hagrid squeezing down behind them, like knocking first year and second years over, <laughs> just to be like, hey, can you come with me now while everyone's distracted by the match? Yeah, because you're being real inconspicuous right now, Hagrid. Sure. Yeah, he's no literally notice. like hunched over trying to like duck behind them in the row behind them. <laughs> no one will notice me. Even yeah. though he's still like four feet taller than everyone. Yeah. <laughs> but he has two black eyes and a bloody nose and looks so distraught that Harry and Hermione immediately agree because what else do you do? Mm -hmm. And so he makes his way back out, flattening all the kids again, and they do as well, apologizing when they get out to the steps. He thanks them and makes a comment about how he hopes that Pepto Bitch Mall doesn't see them. And Harry says that she won't because she's clearly expecting trouble. She actually has all of the Inquisitorial squad sitting with her. Mm hmm Which logistically makes me wonder if they taught her Weasley as our king too, because they're all Slytherins. Yeah. So they had to have just been singing it by her, and apparently she doesn't care about that. Well, no, she's not going to give a shit. Especially with one of Harry Potter's friends. Right? Ugh. Double standards. She knows what her Inquisitorial squad does. Like, oh yeah. She picks the bullies on purpose. Oh, that's why she wanted them, I'm sure. Yeah. So I don't think anything about that song is going to shock or upset her in any way. No, probably not. Mm -mm. But she does apparently seem to be expecting trouble at the match, which Hagrid thinks could be a good thing because it would buy them more time. And they're like, time for what? Yeah, that's exactly what Hermione says. And he just tells them that they'll see <laughs> and starts walking across the lawn in the direction of his cabin, so Harry and Hermione obviously assume that's where they're headed. And when they get there, they turn towards his cabin, and Hagrid just keeps on walking to the woods, where he stops to pick up a crossbow that's leaning against a tree. Oh, this gets better and better. And then he notices that they're not with him and turns around, and he's like, no, we're going in the forest. And Harry's just like, the forest? What the fuck? Why? And he's like, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> keep up we don't want to get seen and just walks right in the forest they have no choice but to follow after him and they're basically running to catch up to him because his strides alone mean they have to take three to his one mm -hmm. harry wants to know why he's got the crossbow which i think is a totally valid question sure but the last time they went into the forest was to see the thestrals and he didn't have to take a crossbow then this is still middle of the day. Like, this isn't yeah, some creepy night adventure. So Harry's rightfully, why are you armed? 
And Hagrid tells him that it's just a precaution because they're going further in than they did the day of the Thestrals. Plus, Ferenz is no longer living in the forest, and Hermione wants to know why that matters. I mean, it matters. Oh, it matters. <laughs> it does matter because all of the other centaurs are super pissed at Hagrid because he's the one who stepped in and basically stopped them from killing Ferenz. Yeah. They were going to kick him to death for agreeing to work for Dumbledore. Yeah. Hermione is very shocked to learn that they attacked Ferenz for that. And Harry's just like, you stopped him? All by yourself? Right. Wow. <laughs> Half giant Harry. Honestly. Harry's not shocked by that at all, though. I love that. He saw the way they acted when Ferenz let Harry ride on his back. Yeah. Hermione hasn't had an encounter with the centaurs before. So it's just kind of what she assumes. Yeah. And apparently she assumes they're, they're just nice horsies. Mm. Would they try to kick him to death? And Harry's over there like, you stopped him all by yourself? <laughs> Heck yeah, Hagrid. But Hagrid's not really taking the praise from that. He's more just pointing out that he couldn't let them kill him. Yeah. And that Ferenz was actually really lucky he was walking by because had he not been, he probably would have been killed. And then he adds on this little comment about you think that he would have remembered that before he started sending these stupid warnings. <laughs> Which I love the fact that they included this because it was just like a nice little reminder that we're about to learn why he was getting those stupid warnings. Yep. And by we're about to, I mean next week because we're getting very near the end of where I cut off this chapter. Yeah. <laughs> Which means we're getting closer to movie scenes. Yeah, sort of. Kind of. But at the mention of the stupid warnings, Harry and Hermione exchange a glance just like, oh, fuck. What are we getting ourselves into? But Hagrid doesn't give them any more information than that. He just says that the centaurs are easily the cleverest creatures in the forest and that gives them a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. So they could get other creatures to turn against Hagrid as well. Yeah. And he just has to be more cautious when he's in there because they're mad at him and the forest is already pretty fucking dangerous. Right. For sure. Hermione wonders if they're going to be going there because of the centaurs. And Hagrid says, no, just that they could complicate things. Mm -hmm. And then says, once more, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is where I decided to cut the chapter because the way that he finds them to bring them into the forest for this next situation is so very different. Yeah. That... I figured we'll get it close enough and hope that next week's episode's not insanely long. Sure. And sort of some of this kind of ish happens in the movie. Kind of. But it's like a line where he tells them, come with me. It, it's not so it'll cover in just fine. We can pick it up there next yeah. week. Yeah. Well, since there aren't any movie scenes this week, gotta wait till next week. We'll just skip right on to our Potter Pondering. Which is, would you rather have Filch take you across the swamp in a boat or just kick you across it? And also, what are some of the ways you think Filch would have liked to send the students across the swamp? Catapult? Slingshot? I mean, what you got? Right. Let us know. And if you are willing to admit that you thought he was kicking them yes. as well, please include mm -hmm. that too. Inquiring minds want to know. Right? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. So normally we would share a Sorting Hat story here, but since we've been doing this for over three years now, you may have noticed that we're running mm -hmm. out of stories, and we've even been resharing some of them, which was mostly to do the Sorting Hat Saturday posts to go along with them, which I have completely been slacking on lately. It has been a very busy time. Seriously. So we have decided that we are just going to skip reading Sorting Hat stories Unless you really want yours reshared, so you can, you know, get a Sorting Hat story picture, too. Or if you just started listening to us and you want us to read yours, please email it to us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com, and we will happily include it in the next episode we record. 
Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. And that brings us to this week's trivia question, which is, who does Umbridge think put a Niffler in her office? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag serves her right will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated, even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon, because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 30, Grop, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calm and Harry on! Oh, for fuck's sake.